So I'll do that again tonight, right? So, so if uh, you're completely lost, yes, go watch the video. If you're semi-lost, yes, go watch the video. But only watch the sections where you kind of got lost, right? Fast forward to that section and then uh, review the that piece. Okay, so today's agenda. So I talked about the data conversion, right? So I mean, I had already talked about that. But we are going into the decisions. So we'll talk about Mr. Uh, George Bull, right? So if you, uh, I don't know if you, well, this is might be your first semester. I don't know if you've taken you've taken discrete discrete structures, right, or discrete math. But they talk about uh, the Boolean logic, and uh, George Bull uh, is the one who created this logic, right? And it was a uh, very simple logic. I'll go into it in a little bit. But he's not like a renowned or he's not a well-known mathematician. Like I honestly never even thought about what where they came up with the name Boolean algebra or Boolean logic. I never gave it a second thought. I was just like, okay, this is how it works, you know, and then I learned it. But uh, a few years ago, I had gotten an email, right, from a the computer society and they were like it's george bull's anniversary you know no? like in 2015 i think it was the 200th anniversary of his birth or something like that mm -hmm. and then i'm like well, who's this guy and then i was reading the bottom and i'm like holy this guy is the one who created the boolean logic like that's why it's boolean right so what's very impressive to me about him is that he self-taught in mathematics in britain right in the 1800s so he didn't have any formal schooling. His dad was a tradesman and since he was a little boy his dad like started teaching him math and then he, he just liked it and he just was self-taught. Uh, his dad like, ran into issues right with his business when George was around 16 and then he, he started teaching math to help out the family, to help support the family. And uh, if you're at a high school and you're taking ACC courses and you're 20 years old, well by that time he owned his own school. Like this guy was teaching math in his own school, right? Which is very impressive to me. At the age of 26, he published some papers of differential equations. I mean, there's a lot of papers published, right? But I mean, some someone with uh, no formal education like was able to push the boundaries of mathematics at that time, which again is very impressive. And then a few years later, he published a paper, the method. You, you won't get quizzed on this. I just feel that it's important that at least you understand, like, well, where does this stuff come from, right? So uh, uh, he published a paper, the Mathematical Analyst, Analysis of uh, Logic, which was the foundation for his uh, Boolean logic, right? And then most of his work uh, from 1847 through 1854 uh, was in the Boolean algebra, Boolean logic field. And uh, that's when uh, he was uh, granted a professorship at the Queen's College, right? Which, assuming back then, was very prestigious, right? Again, that's not like in New York, right? That's across the pond. And then uh, in 1854, he published The Loss of Thought, which was the foundation for computing, the, the mathematical foundation for computing nowadays, right? So. This led to the uh, evolution of the modern age, the telephone switch, and eventually to computers and calculators and anything, anything robotic, right? Like that's based on uh, zeros and ones. Uh, like he laid the foundation down for it. What I find uh, surprising, or I guess because the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s was like, what everybody was focusing on. It took 70 years, right, like to the eight, late 1820s, 1830s, until researchers, right, in computing and engineering, well, actually engineering and math were like, hey, wait a minute, like with this stuff, we can build machines with his math. And then like it took off, right? So there was a period about 70 years when we're like, not a lot of people did a lot with, with his research. And then uh, once they discovered the connection, made the connection, then here we are, right? Hundred years later, almost a hundred year, years later, you know, with uh, cell phones and uh, 
supercomputers that are like small like this, right? And very impressive. So I uh, got this information from Britannica.com, and also like uh, his uh, theory can be found, like a snippet of his theory can be found uh, at this website, right? And if you just do a George Bull uh, Google search and you're in interested in the theory of his math, then you click on the Stanford link. It'll be like the second or third link. And the Britannica is like also the second or third link too. So uh, search results. So. Yeah, so yeah, unfortunately he died young, right? I think it was what? Uh, very young, well, 1815 through 1864. So that's what? Yeah, like not even my age. Wow, impressive. Yeah, so uh, he passed pneumonia. I think uh, in the Britannica site it says that he walked home in cold rain and then he got sick and then he never was able, he was not able to recover. So unfortunately he died. So. Okay, so what is it that he created, right? So he um, he uh, his theory was that anything could be either uh, true or false, right? Or false or true. Like it's either true or false. Like, and from that, right, so in programming we know as on or off, right? Zero or one. And from, from here, he said we can create uh, Boolean expressions. So in programming, we're always creating Boolean expressions. For example, we, we say like if, if x equal y. Right, if it evaluates to true, then do something. So that in Excel, x equal y, that is a Boolean expression. So he created uh, uh, truth tables by using the true and false, and by using uh, and or or not. And not, right? So, and or not. So, how, now, what are these tables? The book talks about the truth tables, right? But it doesn't give you the background on, on the mathematician. So, the and truth table. So, we have x, and then we have y, and I guess we have z, or the result. So, it states that if x is true, and y is true, then then it's true. The z is true, the result is true. And if x is true and y is false, then the result is false. And if x is false and y is true, then it's still false. And obviously if both are false, then then false. So if you're thinking of how to apply this to programming, sometimes you have two conditions you have to check, right? Like, like if if they let me, if I do the dishes, they let me go. Uh, if I do the dishes and clean the bathroom, and do something else, right? So that's kind of like we're formulating Boolean expressions. Or if x equal y and y greater than z, right? So we're creating Boolean expressions, right? So, so now like with this table, if uh, you apply this to test cases, then then you'll be you'll be able, you won't be guessing. Like you don't have to be like, well, I wonder what this expression will equal to, right? You can just uh, remember the truth tables and be like, well, if both are true, then the result is true. Otherwise, false, right? At least one false and all false. And then the or. So we have x, the or truth table x, y, and z. So we will have uh, true and true, true, true and false, and true. So notice at least one true, then it's true. False and true, at least one true, <coughs> true. And if both are false, then that will be false. And then the not we're just inverting them, right? So we have x and then we have z. So if x is true, then not means 
false and so not true means false and false or not false then it's true right so we just invert them it's the opposite so and using uh, these logical operators and or and not we can we can um, build the boolean expressions and create programs right so but this is like the foundation of the decision structures and then sometimes uh, well you need boolean expressions not sometimes you always need boolean expressions for for decision structures and for repetition structures when you get into looping like you're going to be checking a condition which is a boolean expression right and, and once that condition is not true anymore then the looping structure exits and stops right so but this is uh, what it it's based on right so and if you're wondering well, how was how's the connection uh, to the zeros and ones, right? So uh, let me see. Uh, we're comparing strings. Yeah. So okay. So I will we'll talk about that comparing strings, and then I'll I'll show you how the on off uh, or the it's either true or false came about, and I mean we still use that today, like with how we represent data in memory. And I'll, I'll show you when we get to comparing strings. So any questions so far? Okay, so I guess I just did it all in one in one screen uh, page, but that's fine, right? So you will. Uh, have a quiz on the and and the or not today, right? but next week. So make sure that I mean you just remember like and if both are true, it's true. Otherwise, all of them you know if at least one of them is false, then it's false, and then or it's the opposite. If, if at least one of them is true, then true. And then not you just invert it. So that should be an easy hundred on that quiz. Hopefully, right. Okay, so. When we create an if statement in Python, right? So then we have the if, and then we need a Boolean expression, something that evaluates true, true or false, right? So that's a Boolean expression. So if that, if 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 it evaluates to true, then whatever is here, then run it. Otherwise, it won't run it. If it's false, then then we have the next statement over here, then it'll skip and then it'll jump over here if it's false. So that's the if statement. And uh, with Python, unlike other programming languages, the parentheses around the Boolean expression is, is not required. So let me see, what can we come up with here? So let's go to some code and uh, maybe should we validate the truth table with a test case? Yeah. I mean, see what happens, right? So let me see here. Uh, we don't have to write code for that one because we're, we'll just be doing, we, we'll, we'll just use true or false, but in the test case. So let me go here. And I think we're done with this section. And we're done here. We go to decisions, test decisions. So we have this here, and uh, we'll start with an easy one. Test not uh, true table. So we're not. I mean, we're not going to create a function. Right? We just want to see like is Python programmed to honor the truth table that I just showed you. So then we can say uh, self dot uh, assert equal. So not true is false. Oops, I just thought to see C plus plus course. And then uh, and then we say uh, not false then true. All right, so that's that's uh, 
the not truth table. That's what I showed you over here. Right, so we, we simply invert them uh, with the not operator. And uh, we have to go to the run test case and we have to make some changes, right? So we're not working with this anymore. So we have to go run test and then that won't fly anymore. So we say from, and we look at the path, right? So tests. examples and then uh, see decisions test decisions actually uh, decisions. import test decisions and we have to put test decisions here and now let me verify so test examples c decisions uh, from tests examples c decisions import test decisions okay so i should be able to execute or run this new test file now let me save this and then let's see see if that's the case so notice uh Test not truth table. Okay, so so then Python is uh, programmed to honor the truth table, and we can do uh, test and uh, truth table, and we say okay self assert equal, and then we can say uh, okay. So we say uh, true and true. Should be true and then true and false so this is the and truth table so if we ha we have at least one false then it's false okay so false and then, uh, so false and true false, I can spell it, and then false and false should be false. All right, so this is what we had uh, in the truth table, true and true uh, should be true, true and false should be false, false and true should be false, and false and false should be false. We can go to run test and run it, and we are still okay, right? So that's what we want to see. So we have a test and truth table okay, meaning it will produce the same results. And then finally, we go ahead and implement test uh, or truth table. Again, this is required, right? The self. And then assert equal. So then we say uh, true or true, true. That's like asking, you know, like, will you let me go or will you let me go? Right? So yes. We want them to say yes, right? So assert equal. So then we say uh, true or false, and with the or, if at least one is true, then the statement evaluates to true. So that means if we have like like true or false or false or false or false or false or false or false, or false then it'll still be true because there's one true. Okay. And then we have false or true, then true. And then finally, false or false, then false. And then we can go to the run test file. 
run it and uh, test or truth is okay so we're okay right so we can make one of them fail on purpose just to make sure that so we'll say well I'm at a typo here so I'm gonna make it true for the or and then I'll run it and then right away it tells me that it's incorrect okay so I can go back and fix this make it false so questions here um, well apparently it does but we can always make sure right so false is not defined so thinks it's some variable right it's trying to find the variable name false so it fails so it matters Okay. And then we can uh, go ahead and talk about, let me go here, the comparison operators like equal, uh, not equal, uh, less than equal, greater than equal. Uh, cause, because we use those as Boolean expressions, like right? when we use if statements then we will use those to determine if uh, we execute that piece of code or not. So we are at uh, if statement. So in uh, procedural programming, or uh, when you create functions to write programs, right, that's procedural, then we're, we're uh, doing sequential programming, like execute this statement, and then this statement, and then this statement. Even if the statement is a function, so meaning execute this function is still sequential, right? Like, like we have say five statements and three of them are functions, they'll still be executed in order. And sometimes we want to skip a step. So that's where uh, the if statements come in, right? Sometimes we don't want to display something or don't want to execute something. So that's when this branching uh, techniques come in. Like if, if the number is even, uh, display is even, otherwise like we will not display anything for this time, right? If we were using a if else statement, if the number is even, print even, other else print odd, right? So, or you might have like, if we're now looking like into a program, if hours are uh, equal to 40, then process the payroll without overtime, right? But if they're 45, then process this branch that elects, that's a function that knows how to calculate uh, the gross pay with overtime, right? So that's a use case for that. Okay, so let me go up here. If I get too close to the screen to my computer, then it starts getting blurry, so I can't get too close. Let me see here, uh, decisions, decisions py, and we don't have anything here. So let's see. Uh, we were working, remember uh, the last class, we, we were introduced to the remainder operator. And one use case was, well, how, uh, I know, sorry, your name again? Julian. Name? Julian. Julian? Yes. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I was hard to hear with the mask. So Julian was like, whoa, like we, can determine how many beers are left over in a party, right? And I'm like, well, you know, like let's maybe we should use the modulus operator to determine if a number is odd or even, right? So to do that, we have to create a Boolean expression, right? So remember, uh, let me see here. We go here, and I think the example's here. So where are you? Get remainder, right? So this one num1 mod num2 returns the remainder and i think we use five and two so five mod modulus two that's like saying hey give me the remainder of five divided by two so then python gives us one so now we can we can start thinking oh also now i can formulate my boolean expression like is even or 
or either side, it, it doesn't matter, right? But I can say like, if the result of this is uh, actually, if the result of dividing a number by two, right, is zero, then it's even. Otherwise, it's odd, right? So that's what uh, we're after here. We'll create the function to to generate that uh, value for us. So let me go here, and then we can say, okay, so uh, is even, and we accept a number, one number only. So we accept one number, because if we accept two numbers, then uh, we're going to have to write extra code. Here we can simply say uh, return. So I said Boolean expression, right? So divide number by two, and then we need to see if that is equal to zero. And if it's equal to zero, then we should be able to uh, determine if it was odd or even. Let me verify something. Uh, want to compression operators, logical operators. Okay. Um, okay, that's what I covered now. I'm looking for the compression operators for Python. The statement right here. This guy is okay. Mainly because I want to make sure so equal, right? So x equal okay so yeah no i was just wanting to see if it was one or two equal signs because in c plus plus is two equal signs so okay equal zero i saw one right so was it one or two it's two. two okay sorry my glasses didn't let me see okay so so okay what are we doing here so first of all this is a boolean expression why it returns true or false that's why it's a boolean expression every single time this executes Unless, obviously, we send like a letter, it'll return an error. But if, if num is a whole number in the number system that we know, every single time it'll return true or it'll return false. Okay, so this is the Boolean expression. Now we can go and create a test case for it. And the test case should be easy to come up with, right? Because we are aware of all the even and all the odd numbers. We know what numbers to use in here. So we can say, okay, so test is even. And then we say assert equal. And then we are like, okay, so we want something to be true. So if we call this even, which with the number four, then it should be true. And notice here, it's already like, ah, uh, I'm not sure what is even, so we need to help it out, right? So we have to come up here, and we need to bring in that function. So we say, from decisions, import is even. So now we come down here, notice now Python knows that we want to use this function right here, okay? And then we're like, okay, so if I test it with an odd, so then it should return five. So is even with the number five should return false. So notice this test case was easy to come up with because I mean we know we're familiar with that domain. Any questions so far with what we are doing?
Okay, so now we can go to run tests, and then we should be able to execute uh, this program. Oh, let me make sure it's saved, so control S, and then run. Uh, test uh, the function is even, and we're good, we're okay. So that Boolean expression helps us I mean, determine if a number is uh, uh, even or not. And then uh, we wrote code, we tested the code, it's good. Now we can go into our main program and use the function is even, right? So we come up here to SRC, main, decisions is here already, imported. So now we can get a number. And we can say we want it to be an integer. And why? Because we will ask the user for a keyboard entry, right? So enter a number. So we'll get a number. We have to make sure it's an, it's an integer. Otherwise, it'll have an error, right? So we are assuming right now that our end users are perfect. They never make mistakes. So if we ask for a number, they're going to give us a number every time, OK? So this is what I went over at the beginning of class, right? So it'll come in as a character. Say we type 5. But that 5 will be converted to, a, to an integer, to, to a number that the computer understands or recognizes as a number, right? And then we can say if uh, we have to say decisions dot is even whatever number we capture so this is the same as saying equal to true but in python or in most programming languages if you just do that then it's assuming that you're saying oh is this if it's true or false right you know so if it's true, it'll execute. If it's uh, false, then it won't. Right? So we need that there. And then we'll simply print, uh, let me see here, uh, num. I should have gone into, into section 2.9, right? I think we can do comma here. And then uh, is uh, even. And if not, then it will let me know and it will frown at me. And then we'll fix it. Plus sign. OK. So any questions with this simple program, what we're doing here? We're capturing a number. We're sending it into the function we created. And then it's just going to tell us, I mean, if it's even. If it's odd, we're not worried about displaying anything. It won't display anything. But that's OK. Like, we're OK with that right now. We're talking about the if statement and Boolean expressions. And we should be able to run this file from here without any problems. So enter number, and then I'm going to say number 6. And yeah, so I think it was a comma here. So And let's try it again. Uh, if not, we'll go to chapter 2.9, right? So, <laughs> <they should've... laughs> yeah, so it is a comma, right? So, And then uh, let's go ahead and run it one more time. So I'll hit run, and I'll type a number 7. Uh, so notice it didn't display anything. But that's OK. Like, I just wanted to show you that the conditional structures, like, if this evaluates is true, It'll display it. If it evaluates to false, it won't display it. So that was the purpose of this example. Any questions here? OK.
so the if else right so since we're here then we can uh, go to the if else and let me make sure I get the syntax correct on that one so if statement uh, if else okay it works exactly as the programming languages I just want to make sure that it All right, so now every single time we run this program, it'll display something. It'll be either even or odd. Right, so the first time we didn't have the else piece, and now we do. So now whether we type seven or six or odd or even, our program will display something to the screen. So we go here, enter a number six. No loops, we have to run it again. Enter number seven, so seven is odd. Right? It's a very simple program. It shows us questions here. The, um, if does the if have to be on the same line as decisions is even? Decisions is even. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I'm we used to type in parentheses, but I think when I was reviewing the book earlier today, they're not required. To me, it's kind of like, whoa, because I come from the C++ world, right? So, but it, it'll still run, right? So, it still runs, so, so per parentheses here, they're not required. But if you add them, then it still honors them. Like, I won't give you an error. Everything's crystal clear? No one has a single question. Like, everything I'm explaining is just like ingraining into your brain and you'll magically be able to program. Okay. Okay. So, uh, comparing strings, right? So, in programming, uh, everything in the computer is represented as a number. Everything, everything, even letters. Uh, letters are represented as ASCII characters, right? So if we go to the internet, and uh, type uh, ASCII table, and then we bring up the first link ASCII table and let me make this big so I can see it now uh, we'll, we'll worry about the special uh, character who we'll focus on the alphabet right so notice uh, we have a character the letter A right here uh, its decimal value is 65 And the lowercase a, its uh, decimal value is 97. So if we compare a uh, uppercase a to lowercase a, so we're saying if uppercase a greater than lowercase a, what will the result be? False, right? Because, yeah, because uppercase A has a decimal value of 65, and then um, lowercase A has a value of 97. But how, like, how does a computer know about this stuff, right? So let me just briefly show you. So characters. So we have, uh, we have memory. So uh, we have memory, right? So this is computer memory, and then we have uh, blocks of memory. And then we can say that this is uh, one byte, and this is also another byte, another byte, another byte, another byte, another byte, right? So then we can say, okay, uh, one byte is equal to eight bits. Okay, so one byte is eight bits. 
So then if we get a magnifying glass and we're like, okay, so I want to peek into the computer memory. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven, right? So, so then uh, we did that exercise last week, right? So we did uh, uh, two, four, with the square size eight, uh, 16, 32, 64, and 128 and then this is either one right one or zero and remember i was saying how uh george bull said like representing on or off or true or false like we can create some complex um, math mathematical uh, operations right so then uh researchers who uh, invented the computer they're like oh yeah all right so so then they're like well what if we represent this ones as zeros and ones like either on or off zero or one right so let's go and make it simple first so first like the number two decimal value two how would we represent it in this table right so we would say okay so this one's off right because we know we see the two here so then this one's on so we already have we have the value we need already two so then that means that all of these guys are off so now if the if you uh, type the number two on a calculator and you, you type a binary value then it'll give you a zero 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 one zero okay so if we go over here to the ASCII table, what was number two? Uh, start of text, right? So, so if we were trying to represent a character in memory and the value two existed, then this would be the value, right? But we are interested in representing, like for example, 65, right? Uh, the capital letter A in memory. Am I getting quizzed on this? No, but it's important for you all to start learning how all this is in memory, right? So it's good to know. One, uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I want the capital letter A. Its value is 65. So if I if I have a variable. Uh, value in Python, right, equals capital letter A, then we want to see what its representation in memory would be, right? So we know its value is 65, so now we're like, oh, okay, so so 65, so we do need this one to be on, right? Because this one, if it's on, it's one, number one, okay? So on, one. Uh, do we need uh, two on? No. Four, nope, eight, nope, 16, nope, 32, nope, 64, yes, right? 128, no, right? So its value in memory would be 0, 0100001. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So this would be uh, the letter A's representation in memory, right? So if uh, we do comparisons, uh, compare this to lowercase a, then we know that, that this is greater. Uh, the lowercase a has a greater value because behind the scenes, uh, Python will compare their ASCII values, which are uh, numbers, right? So, so it's important to, to understand that. Any questions here? I don't think this is in the book, but it's just so good to know. Like, I mean, it was in the book? Okay. Uh, I didn't read the book, sorry. <laughs> does, does the, the, I guess the computer, does it, or can you, I thought I read something, you do ID and put in capital A and, 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 and will, will it 
return the, the Boolean values, right? Okay. So capitalize. You know, so it was, you know, hit the zero one, the all these zeros and ones. I mean, or does it have a sign of a different number? Okay, ask again. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just saying in in, in Python right now, if we go, can we can we find that? I mean, not that it matters, but I mean. Yeah. Uh, can you find this in the book? No, no, no. In, in oh. Python, if we type type in, will it come back and give us the Boolean number for A? The, the binary number. Oh, yeah. I'm okay. The binary number. Yeah. Uh, there's probably a special function, but I mean. Okay. No, that's yeah. about it. You want to test to see if it's the case? No, no, no. no. We can test it. <laughs> no, we need to stay on track here. I, I, I'm yeah. with you, man. We get off on tangents here. Yeah. You don't believe me. No. <laughs> I'm just I just That's a good question. In C++, you just return a letter as a number, and it will return its number. The, the binary value. The binary value. But I'm uh, pretty sure Python has some functionality to do that. But uh, I'm not sure what it is. But this is what's happening, right? And I think uh, I asked if it's in the book, and it is in the book, right? So. Very element like this, like when you get to uh, computer architecture and organization, then it'll be like a deep dive into memory and how data is represented in memory. And uh, it's actually very interesting. OK, so maybe now we can compare strings, right? So let's compare strings. And uh, we can. We don't have to write functions. We can do the same as we did for the test case. We'll just go to the ASCII table. And then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, compare them with Boolean expressions in the test case, and then we'll see if, if they're good or not. So we go here and go to the test case. Uh, test. Uh, we'll start with character. A comparison. So then we can do that that one that we were talking about, right? The lowercase a and uppercase a. So we will do equal, right? We'll, we'll do equal and see what happens. We're like is a equal to a. And that should be false, right? According to what we just learned. And then once we do that, we have to go to run test uh, file and we can execute it. So we go here and then we run it. And where is it? Uh, test char character comparison, we're OK. Again, let's look at what we were doing, right? So we're just saying, is lowercase a equal to uppercase a? False, right? Visually, we're like, wow, they're not, you know? But now we know like how the computer is comparing them. It's comparing their numerical value. And then we can, uh, we can say, uh, is a greater than a? This one, like we might be like uh, no, right? Because it's lowercase a, so it shouldn't be greater. Like if we were looking at like the size, right? Because it's uppercase, and like at least that's how I would think. Well, little a can be bigger than uppercase a, right? Because it's smaller. But in here, the way they created that ASCII table, then this should also hold. So a uh, so what is the value 97 I think right so lowercase a has a value of 97 and then we go and look for uppercase a has a value of 65 so in essence we're saying is 97 greater than 65 right so then yes true then we go to run test and we're still we're still okay so. Test character comparison. 
So is uh, your understanding? Yes. On, on your test, can you go back to the, mm -hmm. the I, I thought before, man, I just didn't remember. I thought when we were doing the self assert equal, I thought what we, what we thought we wanted, what we thought it was, and we put that in the in the first parameter of the first, you know, then comma, and then we, we called in our function. I'm thinking of last week. Mm -hmm. like when it, it, does it matter the way, the way that you're writing it? it, it they got to be equal, so it doesn't matter. In this case, like, in, even in the other case, it doesn't matter. Like, behind the scenes, it'll create a Boolean expression, right? So if if we have uh, if we have like the function first or second, it doesn't matter. It's still gonna compare a number against a number. Yeah. So, but that's a good question. Any other questions? Okay. Say again? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, I I did say that in the other class because we're in the we're in the same right. In the C plus plus class, we're barely going into decisions, and I talked about George Bull. But like, uh, you're right. Like, when you see an IP address, like if you see like an internal IP address, like 192.168.1.5, like those are actually uh, representing binary numbers, right? So, so that's why it's like a big number, but we're still like running out of, we ran out of IP addresses, right? So now they have the new convention, the IPv6, IP6, right? Okay, so. String comparisons, and operator I talked about, or operator we talked about, not operator. Short circuit eva evaluation, we will uh, look at it in a little bit. Let me see. Uh, one of the, this, this statement I wanted to go into. So, uh, for example, like a common homework assignment that uh, is given with the uh, if l if else right or if else if right that's what it is like if else if what they call it if if else is like for example like like you get a number and then you want to return like the letter grade right so like 95 so if number greater than or equal to 90 and less than equal to 100 then we then the letter grade is a uh, else if 80 through 89 right and so that's a common uh, use case for this one. And uh, let me, I can't use the one I use for the programming class and I'll go with the one they have here for this one. Let me see, uh, ah, look, a common one and it's there. Okay, so how can we put this in a function, right? Because here, like there's no function. All right, so uh, in the past, like a lot of students are like, yeah, but the book just like gives you the snippet, and then when you show us an example, then it's in a function. So, what are what are we trying to return here? What's com What's the common case that they are returning here? Your grade is D. Your grade is right. So then we're like, oh, so we can return. We instead of printing, we can say return your grade is a right and then we put this in a function and we name the function calculate uh, letter grade or get letter grade right so so we go here into the decisions and then we can say uh, def uh, get letter grade we need a grade and then we can finally write code in a function that's more than one line, right? Because we're always using like return, return, return. So this will be the first example where we write more than one statement, right? So I don't think I've mentioned this, right? But in Python, like like when I was here, right? So I was here, I typed the colon, just press enter, and Python will take care of the typing for you. And then once you finish the statement, then just press enter again, like 
if you, if you like type something here like return, then Python doesn't like it because it uses the the tabbing and the return to determine where the code for our function is. Right? Does it, is it one line? Is it two lines? Is it three, four, five lines? Right? So, okay. So let's see. Also, they're just saying that there's only been one program that's ever been written, and everybody just copies of that one. So I'm going to copy this one. As an example, right? so, so if grade uh, greater than or equal to A score or B score, well, we're not going to do that. We'll just put like 90, okay, to make it simple. So if grade uh, greater than or equal to 90, then here we can simply say, uh, we'll just say A, okay? Like we'll just say like return A, return A back, okay? And then we can, uh, so here they are printing, but we're in a function and we want our code to be testable. So for our code to be testable, we have to return a value, okay? So that's why we're modifying the example a, a little bit. Right? Well, actually, a lot. Right? <laughs> Any questions here? Like, this is easy, right? Like, so how do I test this? OK, so I have to go to the test case. I have to uh, get letter grade, call it, send it like 95, and then it should return A. So then I can say, oh, OK, so let me go to the test case. Let me save this first. Notice I'm not writing everything that you see here. I did one statement, the if piece. Now I'm going to the test case. So I'm following the code test, code test, code test. Although it's just one function, it may take me longer than someone who's just going to type out the whole function, right? But if this is a complicated function with uh, math operations, then it's better to write a little piece of code than test it. And that passes, then go back, write another little piece of code, test it. By the time we go through that process and finish the function, we're very confident that this function does what it's supposed to do. Okay? So that's what we're going to do here. And this type of development is uh, known as test driven development. Right? So we're letting the test guide us. Test get letter grade. Again, this is required, right? So then we can say self dot assert equal. And if the letter A is, we expect letter A when we call get uh, letter grade, which I don't think is there yet. So remember, anytime we bring in a new function that's in the same file, we can copy all the way to import, paste, and then say uh, get letter grade. So now like Python will be able to find our new function, OK? And if you see that it's like dimmed out, that's telling us that we have not used it yet. Like it's saying get letter grade is not accessed, meaning like we've not used it here. So once I uh, go up here, so if you're here, you can type control space. Notice get letter grade comes up with the intelligence. And then I can say like 90. So in uh, English, right, if uh, I'm expecting the letter A when I call the function get letter grade with the value of 90, right? That's what I'm saying here. And it, it doesn't matter, like if get letter grade is on the left or on the right side. I think the convention I've used is like this. Questions here with the test? Yes. Um, Name, uh, sir? Uh, Robert. Robert, okay. Um, like more like observation on, on the test decision mm -hmm. um, on that bottle on the top in line three. So whenever I added the new function to test get letter grade, it added it right there on your line three where it says import A, B, and testing B. Oh, it auto added it, right? Is that like a Python thing? That's an intelligence. That's the. So if you, we, I click here on extensions, that's a good observation. 
offers Python. There's a Python extension. So, so an extension is a utility that helps us. Uh, so this Python Intelli look, Python IntelliSense, right? So somebody wrote a lot of code for us um, to make programming easy, right? So, but yeah, that is. I guess I had, I had, uh, yeah. And e is even. I went and typed this even first, yeah. but I didn't notice that it added it. So you see, they, they don't want programmers to make mistakes. So they, so and it's very helpful. Like once you learn all the shortcuts and stuff, like with the IDE, I used to know them, but I don't program every day anymore. So now I kind of struggle sometimes. Okay, let's run the test case. Right enough talk. So let's see what happens. Uh, okay, so make this here. Get uh, test get letter grade. Okay. On purpose. Uh, let's uh, say well, what if I? I mean, I know I haven't written anything for 80s, right? But I'm like, well, what if I uh, do 80? 85, what happens? Anyone? It won't return from the function, so our test case will fail, right? It should fail. So, so it fails. So uh, in test-driven development, we purposely do that. So now we want to add just enough code to make the assertion that's failing pass, right? So that, that's where we're letting the test cases drive our development. So we come back to decisions and we're like, oh, okay, so uh, I think it's a lift, right? Let me, let me try to get that syntax right. Yeah, the lift, okay. So writing just enough code to make the assertion that's failing green, or to make it pass, right? And why did the industry start doing this? Because they found out that sometimes developers are writing code or extra code, code that really wasn't necessary. So then they're like, well, I mean, why don't we just let test cases drive us and then just write enough code? You know, to make them pass, like, and that translate into a higher level, like, it, make the program good enough for the user, right? And then the users use it; they go into a trial period, and then they might come with new features, right? But then, then those new features, then you just write enough code to make those new features good enough, because they found out that there was like too many lines of code that were just bells and whistles that weren't really necessary, right? Maybe one user was like a power user or an executive with influence, right? And then they would have to write a lot of code, but then they're like, no, let's just go to this methodology. Because guess what? If you write 100 lines of code or 1,000 or 100,000 or 1 million, someone has to maintain the code, right? So why not write like the fewest code possible? Because in the future, as, as our code's like growing, I mean, would you rather, work with 100,000 lines of code or 200,000 lines of code? 100,000, although it seems like a lot, but that's like the whole thinking behind this <clears throat> kind of programming. And if you're wondering, like, sir, I'll probably never work at a place that has 100,000 or a million lines of code. Well, what if you work at IBM, right? Or Google, you know, or Microsoft? Like, uh, how many lines of code do you think Windows has, right? So. So that's why I have to teach like this, because then what you learn can scale, like wherever you go. Okay, any questions so far with what we are doing? We go here, and it should still be green, right? So notice uh, everything should be okay. And if I grow this, expand that, so get a little gray, uh, it's failing, but I think I went too far, right? So let me clear this, all right. Clear, and let me run it again. And okay, right, so uh, where are you? Uh, get letter grade, right? So yeah, I had scrolled up 
too high. And then uh, we're on to what? 850, right? 850, right? So we got what? Okay, so yeah, I gotta hurry to finish this example. So now I will short circuit the process and I have to go finish this function, right? So I'll be like, okay, so uh, grade uh, greater than or equal to 70, I return C. Uh, grade uh, greater than or equal to 60, return uh, D, don't forget that guy, uh, and then uh, grade greater, uh, okay, how are they doing it? I, what, 50 is below us, so now greater than zero, I guess, or greater than or equal to zero? What did they do here? Else pass, okay, good. Else pass. So then, yeah, so then we say else. Uh, sorry, but so that's what's going to happen in this class if you show up and don't drop the course. Remember, I told you all that. So, this is a good time to rem remind you all if for some reason you, you know, they changed your schedule, you got sick, someone in your family got sick, you have to take care of them. Please, please drop the course, right? Don't. Uh, Leave it up to me because I will not drop you. Okay, so then we can come in here and then we can say 75. Should we should expect C 65? We should expect D uh, 55 uh, F and uh, uh, let's see what happens with uh, 35. That should be F and so forth and so forth. And uh, well, what happens if I uh, type in like 1,000? All right, so let, let's test that case too. All right. Yeah. So, but that's what test cases are for, right? And then we're like, okay, so what happens if uh, I type in negative 10, right? So, and then we go ahead and run it. Yeah, so we go to the run test, and we go here, and uh, uh, clear, let me clear this, and run, oops, I got stuck, control C, also, let me just run it, okay, there we go, so what happened, nothing failed? Right, so we need to fix this, but we won't fix it today. We'll fix it. So notice how uh, the example in the book has flawed logic, but we wouldn't really think about it if we didn't have a test case. So we'll go in and add the code to fix this in the next class. Right. So. Okay, let me stop this here. And